We begin today's show in Haiti, where deadly violence continues between armed groups and police in Port-au-Prince. On Tuesday, U.N. rights chief Volker Turk deplored what he called the unprecedented scale of rights abuses in Haiti. There has been a shocking rise in killings and kidnappings. Sexual violence, particularly targeting women and young girls, is pervasive and very likely to have reached levels not seen before. As the number of people internally displaced rises, over 360,000 now, according to IOM, so too does a further risk of sexual violence as people find themselves away from their homes and their communities. The scale of human rights abuses is unprecedented in modern modern Haitian history, inflicting a humanitarian catastrophe on an already exhausted people. The spiraling political turmoil in Haiti appears to have no end in sight. Recently resigned Prime Minister Ariel Henry, who remains locked out of Haiti by armed groups, raised questions this week over the constitutionality of a transitional council, which is being formed to serve as an interim governing body until elections are scheduled. This comes as Canadian forces have been sent to Jamaica to train troops from Jamaica, Belize and the Bahamas to join the U.N.-authorized mission to Haiti, led by Kenya. Last week, the U.N. human rights chief called for an arms embargo on Haiti, calling the situation there cataclysmic. The majority of guns pouring into Haiti are smuggled in from Florida and other parts of the United States. For more, we're joined by two guests. Here in New York, Kim Ives is with us, the editor of the English language section of the weekly Haiti Liberté, where he's also co-directed the documentary series Another Vision. And in Vancouver, Canada, Jamima Pierre is a Haitian-American scholar, professor at the Social Justice Institute at the University of British Columbia in Canada, and research associate at the University of Johannesburg. We welcome you both back to Democracy Now! Professor Pierre, let's begin with you. Can you just lay out overall the situation at this point in Haiti, with a resigned president not able to come back into Haiti? He's condemned a tra transitional um, panel to rule Haiti, um, and uh, this Cara Caribbean group um, led by Kenya um, training to move in so-called U.S. U.N. peacekeepers. Good, good morning, Amy. Thanks for having me back. I uh, what's going on in Haiti are uh, a, a number of armed groups. Um, um, at first coming together to say that they were working um, together as an informal coalition. But uh, the violence um, had been primarily in the Port-au-Prince area. And, and I have to stress that, because the, 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 the Western media is presenting this as a, a countrywide civil war and so on. But um, the, the, there are some violence on, on outside of Port-au-Prince, but the majority of the violence, um, the, 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 the gun shooting is, is actually in the Port-au-Prince area, primarily in, in the, uh, the popular neighborhoods and around there. It's, and especially now where you have um, some of these groups trying to take over parts, you know, trying to have uh, uh, battles with the with the police. So, so that's the first. The, the second thing that we have to, to, to um, to talk about then is this supposed um, uh, presidential council that the U.S. is putting together use, using CARICOM as the front-facing um, party. CARICOM is the Caribbean communities using CARICOM as the front-facing party um, to basically say that they have a supposedly Haitian-led solution for a transition in Haiti. Um, the problem with that so-called Haitian-led solution is that. It's the U.S., France, and Canada, which, as we've known before, are the major forces the state that have destabilized Haiti, uh, at least in the past 20 years. They're the ones um, leading the discussion, U.S., France, Canada, Brazil, um, leading the discussion along with the Caribbean community. Um, but the, as we said before, the, 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 there needs to be, for the Haitian participation, they have to agree for a multinational, multinational uh, security force to come in. Basically, to, in order to participate in this conversation, you have to, you have to be okay with a foreign invasion, which itself is, is a problem and basically tells us that the U.S. is controlling the situation. Now, this foreign military force, people will have to remember that it is not a U.N. Um, force. It's U.N. sanctioned, which is surprising, right? Um, but it is a, a force that is coming in with absolutely 
it's not even clear what this mandate is. There's a 33-page document that talks about the security force, but we don't know um, what you know what the rules of engagement will be. Um, how will we prosecute uh, the you know the inevitable um, war crimes that I think will happen when you have foreigners coming in and shooting at a population? But the other thing is, Canada is training uh, uh, Jamaicans, uh, Bahamians um, to come in for uh, uh, for. It, as if they're coming into a war zone, and that itself bodes badly for us, in uh, for people in Haiti. And so, so I think this is a terrible situation in the sense that it, what's happening in Port-au-Prince is a result of guns being brought into the country from the U.S., Dominican Republic, and Jamaica. But the other thing is that whatever solution that the U.S. is having is a completely inadequate an unconstitutional and illegal solution. And even the military force that the U.S. is trying to bring in. We have to remember they tried to get Brazil to lead it, Canada to lead it. They all said no. Um, that force itself is, is not constitutional because it was asked by an illegitimate government, Ariel from 2022. So it's a, it's a terrible situation. But I think that the, the idea that this is a Haitian, there's a Haitian-led solution coming is actually a false one and, and one that is misleading. And, and uh, Professor Pierre, I wanted to ask you about this transitional council. Uh, it's it's supposedly been meeting now for several weeks, and it, uh, nothing seems to have come out of it. How is even the decision making uh, of this council? Uh, is it is that transparent? Is it by vote, by consensus? And uh, could you talk a little bit more about the council? Well, we, we don't know much about the council, um, and it's not transparent. These are supposedly negotiations happening between CARICOM and especially the Guyanese president, um, um, who and, and you know, who has been very belligerent about these members of, of, of this community, um, the Haitians that they've chosen to participate in this discussion, that they have to agree to this multinational mission. Apparently, they came up with this, you know, members of the council has um, have been chosen. Some people dropped out uh, in terms of leadership. The council is made up of um, uh, supposedly uh, people chosen by the U.S., members of the political class, the old political class that people really don't want to have anything to do with, but key members of that. And there's infighting uh, amongst them. But recently, just I think uh, a few days ago, the president of um, uh, of Guyana sent a letter to Ayo Henri to get his permission to ratify this transitional council, which itself um, should tell us everything we need to know. The fact that this ousted um, illegal, illegitimate prime minister has to have a say in this transitional council. So I'm not sure. You know, at first they, they were saying that they were giving them 48 hours to come up with uh, a council to to allow this transition. And the U.S. thinks it needs this council in order to make it seem like a military force coming into Haiti is legitimate. But I'm not sure how far we're going to get with that because. You know, I think for, for Haitian people, this is a completely obscure process that leaves regular people out uh, of the discussion. Yeah, I'd like to uh, to bring in Kim Ives of uh, AT uh, Liberté. Uh, Kim, you recently helped uh, an American YouTube personality there, Addison Pierre Malouf, uh, who was kidnapped, uh, uh, obtained his release. Could you talk about what happened there and your sense of what's going on in Haiti? Yes, uh, Juan, this was a YouTuber who went down um, and thought he was just going to drive from Cape Haitian, where he'd flown into, down to uh, Port-au-Prince and interview uh, Jimmy Cherizier, known as Barbecue. Uh, and he was kidnapped along the way. He spent 17 days in jail. Uh, he paid some ransom, or his family paid some ransom, friends. And uh, once they paid, they weren't released. The uh, kidnappers wanted more. And that's when they published the thing last Friday. Uh, Dan Cohen, the co-director of Another Vision, and myself saw this uh, come up on, on the uh, radar and uh, immediately called Sherry Zier and said, what's going on? I thought you guys were stopping, uh, <laughs> you were going to shut down the kidnappers. And he said, let me get on it. And um, a few days later, he uh, uh, managed to convince uh, or pressure uh, um, Lamour saint jour the kidnapper, to release uh, uh, your fellow Arab, as this YouTuber is called. And um, so, yeah, it was, uh, uh, I could say, a victory for the Vivant Somme coalition that Cherizier has put together, 
which is basically his anti-crime groups versus the uh, former criminal groups, which are supposed to be dropping it, but as we can see, they're still doing some kidnapping. Can you talk more about, go ahead, Juan. No, no, I was just going to ask him about this issue of the, what we hear in the media is that these are all uh, criminal gangs that are operating, but you have a different perspective on that. And I'm wondering if you could elaborate on the distinctions that you've tried to make with some of these gang groups or these, or, or these paramilitary groups, really. Sure, uh, completely. This is this is a revolutionary process we're watching unfold in Haiti. Um, these are basically armed neighborhood committees. Some of them have gone down a criminal road. Others are fighting against the criminals. And uh, as a result, um, the U.S. is afraid of this because the anti-criminal groups led by Cherizier have a revolutionary agenda. They want to change the system in Haiti. They want to overthrow it. And the U.S. flagged him as a danger early on. We have been um, looking into him uh, carefully over the past uh, four years and seen that he's the genuine article, as far as we can see. And uh, they're trying to always demonize the Haitian people. They did this in a century ago in 1915 when Charlemagne Peralt uh, organized what were at that time also considered bandits, uh, the Cacos, who had been sort of uh, rural uh, ruffians who would ride into Port-au-Prince and overthrow a government and that sort of thing. Um, but he forged them into a guerrilla force which fought the U.S. Marine occupation of 1915 uh, that landed, uh, was in the country till 1934, and uh, they were all called bandits. So they always have to demonize, criminalize the people's resistance, and that's what we're seeing today when they tried to put uh, all the armed groups of the Haiti's popular classes into one bag called the gangs. Kim, I wanted to go to a documentary series you did in 2022 called Another Vision, and that tells the story of Barbecue, of Jimmy Charizier and the revolutionary forces of the G9 family and allies. Um, let's go to a clip. You're sick, Dad? What do you have? You have pain? A pain in your leg? I can't even stand up. You can't stand up? Did you go to the hospital? Why didn't you go to the hospital? I have no money. I have nothing. You have no money to go to the hospital? No. Okay. I'm going to finish doing this video to show the entire world the conditions you are living in. This is a person, a Haitian born and raised nappy hair, a child of Dessaline, same as me, where a group of men have taken the country hostage and joined with a bunch of politicians, and they've reduced the people to the misery they are living in today. So that's Barbecue, Jimmy Charizier, talking to a man in a flooded out area, a very poor neighborhood. Um, Talk about why he got the name Barbecue and what you see happening right now. Um, uh, has, as uh, Professor Pierre was saying, uh, why is Ariel Henry even weighing in now? Hadn't he resigned? And it was Charizier who demanded, along with the other armed groups, that he not come back and that he did resign. Yeah, well, Cherizier is the one responsible for keeping Ariel out after finally um, getting Ariel out of power, as uh, almost all of Haiti had been uh, demanding over the past uh, three years. Um, essentially, just to go to your first question, he got the name Barbecue because in his neighborhood growing up, there were three Jimmys, and they would give each one the nickname of what their parent did, and his mom sold barbecued meat, so he became Jimmy Barbecue. But this has been spun by the uh, disinformation agents to be that he burns people alive and this sort of thing. Uh, they've been trying to demonize him all along. But this uprising is basically uh, threatening this political class. The U.S. has been was using Ariel Henry, and they were holding on to him too long. Uh, it's hard to shift horses when you're uh, galloping uh, down the road of uh, towards disaster, and so they were loath to leave Ariel until they absolutely had to, and finally that came on February 29th when Cherizier more or less 
put together all the uh, armed groups of Port-au-Prince, even the criminal groups that he's been fighting for four years, and uh, basically said, you cannot land at the airports. And the people in uh, OCAP, which was the only other airport where Ariel could have landed, uh, also organized to, to block his plane landing there. So he was out. The U.S. had to shift. But they created this seven-headed monster, which everybody's uh, uh, shocked at. Um, and all its members have discredited themselves, completely disgraced themselves. You mean this transitional this council. This transitional council, because they had to agree to a foreign military intervention. Now, Haiti just finished with a foreign military intervention only five years ago. In 2019 was the end of the Minijust, which followed on the Minista, 13 years of Minista. So you had 50 UN peacekeeping forces. Right. The first, after Aristide was overthrown by the U.S., <clears throat> the U.S. installed the MINUSTA, which was, again, a cheaper-priced uh, military force to occupy Haiti for uh, 13 years, from 2004 to 2017. And then from 2017 to 19, they had a sort of wind-down force called the MINIJUST. So 2019 is when MINIJUST left. And uh, here we are, four years later, back in the same problem. This is not a problem that can be solved with military force. This is a socioeconomic problem, as Sherry Zier is always saying. People need to eat. They need schools, hospitals, roads, sanitation, electricity, uh, internet. They need the basics of life. And this is what he has been fighting for. And this is. You know, the essence of any of these revolutions, which we, we, we've seen throughout history. I mean, the Bolsheviks uh, had their revolution on the basis of land, peace, and bread. So the people are demanding uh, change. And right now, this political class, which uh, basically the oligarchy was using the criminal gangs to attack Cherizier. They, they've been fighting for the past four years. Now, Cherizier has taken them or tried to take them into some kind of alliance. We'll see how long it lasts. It's a little bit, you have to think, like Mao Zedong with Chiang Kai-shek in the early 40s to drive out the Japanese from China. He had to ally with some of his bitterest enemies. but. It, they succeeded. So we'll see how far the Vivan Sum coalition gets. It's going to be a messy process, as revolutions always are. Uh, Professor Pierre, uh, I'd like to get your take on the situation and and, uh, and also the uh, Kim Ives' analysis that some of these armed groups uh, have revolutionary potential or or, pro or attempting a revolution. Well, um, the the. the the truth is, um, well, not the truth, but part of part of my um, uh, the reality is a lot of people, um, a lot of people, I haven't seen that. So part of it is, it is a, a controversial take from Kim, who I, I respect. I, I do think um, I'm actually a lot more agnostic about what's going on um, in, in terms of um, these armed groups and what they will end up um, doing um, at, at at this uh, um, in the future. But at this point. A lot of people in um, in the popular neighborhoods and so on and so forth see these armed groups as the groups that have really um, really uh, impacted their lives in, in in the poor neighborhoods, and they don't they see them as people who are getting arms and 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 money from the oligarch, from the political elite, and 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 so they don't necessarily make that distinction. And so you know that that I, I so my my point of view is that is that. You know, if this is a revolution, we're waiting for it to actually um, uh, come to fruition. But in the meantime, what's happening are a lot of people that are being displaced and that are 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 um, uh, that are seeing that their 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 biggest foe are these armed groups that a lot of them mix together as one because what they see, is, you know, what they feel are bullets, what they hear are bullets, and what they see is. Um, um, uh, 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 they, they're living in a space where there's a lot of violence and a lot of pain. And so, and so then, if there's a revolution, there needs to be a particular kind of ideology that takes over the entire the country, and that remains to be seen. 